Now I'd like to discuss with you the Mark of the Beast. It's a financial system that will be the new way of life for the world once Satan's elite, elite place the world on a complete lockdown. Okay? Revelations chapter 13, verse 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. What most people don't know is that this system is already in place. And the countries that using this system, it's already a way of life for them, and it has been. Let's take a look. Finally from us this evening, technology on the cutting edge. We were interested today to hear that more than 100 law enforcement officials in Mexico are having microchips implanted in their arms. The chips allow a person to be scanned, sort of like a cereal box at the supermarket checkout. In Mexico, this will be one more tool in the fight against crime. Here's ABC's John McKenzie. You've seen it before, right out of Hollywood. It's maybe a little uncomfortable. A microchip inside the body. A hidden high-tech identification tag. There are the access codes to your job spot. Now Mexico's attorney general and 160 of his deputies have had microchips implanted in their arms to control access to the country's new criminal investigation center. It is to provide access, said the attorney general, to the right people in exclusive areas where there is valuable, sensitive information. The microchip, the size of a grain of rice, is injected under the skin and gives off a low-frequency radio wave. A scanner reads each chip's identification number to verify an official's security clearance. The microchip is tamper-proof, it's secure, no one can take your microchip and use it to their advantage to gain access to your facility. The chip, developed by Applied Digital Solutions, is similar to those used in the U.S. to identify and return runaway dogs. In humans, it can have several uses. A little stick. The chips can also be programmed to carry medical information. The one in this patient details his blood type, allergies, and the fact he has Alzheimer's disease. The device is now awaiting approval from the Food and Drug Administration. Some researchers are developing microchips for use in the home, so that wearing one can turn on lights and open doors. Hands free. The next step, say researchers, is developing an implantable chip with a global positioning system to track people miles away, whether kidnapped or lost, just as cars can now be traced. A kind of low jack for the body. But some citizens are embracing the age of Big Brother. In Rotterdam, Holland, nightclub owner John Van Gallen has introduced a system of microchipping for his VIP patrons. It's almost like barcoding people. Yeah, it is. Because every chip got a number, and the number corresponds to the name and the picture. That's the way it is, yeah. It is. The microchip has to be surgically inserted under the skin which means you'll have to have it cut out if you want it removed. Did it hurt getting the chip yeah. in? No, no, no. Okay, can I have a look? Yeah, of course. It feels like a little grain of rice. It's a rice, uh, yeah. Irving has had the chip for the past four years. Every time he buys a drink, he scanned. And like a human ATM, money comes off his account. You don't feel like you're giving up a little bit of your privacy, do you? No. No. It's just nice to have. You can say, I have a chip in my arm. <laughs> I'm the first one in the whole world. I, I, I have a chip. And, yeah. Now, let's look at the word mark in the book of Revelations. The Greek, in the Greek, it's G5480 from your Strong's Concordance. Now, your Strong's Concordance, this has every word indexed and defined in the Hebrew, which was mainly written in the Old Testament, which was written in the Old Testament, excuse me, and the Greek, which is the New Testament. So, let's look up the word Mark in the book of Revelations for this scripture. In your Strong's Concordance, it's G5480, which is charagma, which means scratch, etching, 
or engrave. Okay. So now let's read this definition. Let's excuse me. Let's read the scripture with the Greek definition in place. And let's see to get for us to get a complete picture. Now, when there's an implementation of anything, the elite powers do it in a slow process. Satan works through generations, okay? So we've been using gold and silver as our currency in the ancient times. Then for us, we've moved to greenbacks or cash. Then it was checks. Now it's been past, you know, a couple of decades, it's been debit cards and credit cards. Now it's credit cards and debit cards with a chip. So all these stages have been conditioning us for the mark. They will use the media to start planting ideas in our head for us to start getting used to the idea of having this new financial system. Let's take a look. More now of our special coverage here tonight, life in the U.S. in 10 years' time. By that time, there may be all kinds of new ways to safeguard and identify all those things that make each of us unique, our faces, even our fingerprints, even our eyes. Here now with more on the future of technology, NBC's Tom Costello. The year is 2017. You're rushed to a hospital, unconscious with no ID or medical history, but thanks to a microchip under your skin, it's all there. Science fiction 20 years ago, but a biometric reality today. The technology is based on answering one simple question. Am I who I say I am? Already, fingerprints and iris scans verify passenger identities at airports. Within 10 years, that technology may be even more widespread. And look for more complex facial recognition programs that scan a crowd of thousands looking for a single terrorist. Today's facial recognition software starts with the eyes. Then, it maps out the contours of the face and compares that against a database of millions, a database that's growing by the day. What's next? At the University of Bath in England, researchers predict big changes for consumers. I think it is possible to free us completely of our wallets and keys using biometric technology, if that's what people want in 10 years' time. In fact, it's already here. The latest home security locks use fingerprints to control deadbolts. And at the Jewel Osco grocery store in Chicago, some customers pay using their fingerprints. No paper or plastic. You don't really need anything other than your hand, and you already got that with you. So will future department stores scan our irises, like in the movie Minority Report, then offer products catered to who we are? Hello, Mr. Yakamoto. Welcome back to the Gap. Experts say that technology is here now. The challenge is to safeguard our privacy in a brave new world. Tom Costello, NBC News, Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, the latest breakthroughs. Turns out one of the biggest discoveries is actually this tiny. See how small that is? This little chip may be the next big thing. And it sounds like it's right from a sci-fi movie, but people all over the world are implanting these into their wrists. So I asked my producer, Dean, to find out more about this cutting-edge technology and what it could mean for your health. Whether it's our smartphones, our watches, our fitness trackers, or our Bluetooth headphones, it's clear that technology is not just part of our lives, it's running them. It's how we buy things, watch things, how we date, stay safe, even how we travel. Paul? Cool. We're so attracted to our devices that they're basically becoming a part of our bodies. But what if they really could become a part of our bodies? Well, guess what? They can. Meet the RFID microchip. This tiny chip, which can be implanted into your wrist, yes, I did say wrist, uses short-range radio frequency identification, similar to the tech used to track your pets or your phone. Once implanted in your body, it could identify you as you pass through the airport, open the door to your home. It could even be used to buy groceries at the supermarket. Now, your driver's license, passport, keys, and wallet are all inside your body, contained in something the size of a grain of rice. I know it might sound like sci-fi, but it's not. 10,000 people have already been chipped and the number is growing. The possibilities are limitless, especially when it comes to your health. Imagine you're rushed to the hospital without any identification, but with just one scan of your chip, 
Doctors know your name, date of birth, medical history, insurance, blood type, allergies, even the medication you're taking. This chip in your wrist won't just change your life, one day it might just save it. And that's why this little RFID microchip is the next big thing. Now, let's look at some of the attributes of this mark, of this chip. I can't believe you just paid with this hand. Like you just literally put your hand up and you're good to go. Like that's crazy. Hi, my name's Charles. Also, if you get out of line, um, they'll kill you. Oh, and by the way, it can kill you if you get out of line. <laughs> A closer look at the who and the why behind this idea. All right, this next story may sound like something out of, uh, well, a Hollywood thriller. A Saudi inventor has created a killer microchip. It's designed to track terrorists and criminals and, well, you can think of somebody. Not only does it include a GPS device, it also has a lethal dose of cyanide, which can be activated at any time. You get my point? The inventor's bid for a patent has been rejected in Germany. Joining us now this morning to talk about it, Jake Ward, deputy editor of Popular Science. Okay, this is pretty macabre, pretty uh, sinister and nefarious. How exactly would this work? Well, there's a, a category of technology uh, that involves GPS tracking systems being shrunk down to the size where you could actually implant it surgically. And we've seen a number of applications for this. Um, this is without question the most sinister version of it that I've certainly heard of. Um, you know, and, and the notion of tracking criminals is not new, but the notion of killing them remotely, I think, is, is a whole new thing. Yeah. Fine, you completely belong to Satan and you're completely connected to his grid. You clearly have made your choice and there is no grace for you. you your, seal, your fate is completely sealed. That's why it's so dangerous to have any attachment to this world system. Now let's discuss how they will bring in this chip, the mark of the beast, because it says he will cause everyone to get the mark. The word cause, okay, we need to examine that word cause. In the King James Version, this word cause in the Greek, Strong's and coordinates, is G4160. It's poeo, which means to make or to do, okay? However, the deception comes if you're reading the NIV version, which says force people to get the mark. And we think the word force is the same in the Greek, okay? It, which means to convey the idea of force suddenly exercised. So the NIV, again, is from the pit of hell. It's made to deceive you and to get you off course. Real quick, in the NIV it says on your right hand or on your forehead. But the King James Version says in your right hand or in your forehead. So you see the deception between using on and in, okay? So if you don't believe me, the NIV is from the devil, please Google the connection between the NIV, Satanic Bible, and the book of uh, called The Joy of Gay Sex. Put those three books together in Google and you'll see what I'm talking about, okay? But now let's get back to this system, how the system will be implemented. Using the word cause means they will bring about situations where you will want to get the chip or you will feel you have no choice. They already be con they've already been conditioning us for this cause. Your pets have the chip cause they might get lost. The el elderly have been getting chipped because grandpa or grandma has Alzheimer's and they might wander off and hurt themselves. So we've been conditioning this whole time for the cause. Now, for us, the majority masses, the cause has to be something different, okay? So again, it's connected to a financial system. So the, force, the first step they have to do to create this massive global cause is called force debt creation, okay? The Bible says the borrower, the borrower is slave to the lender. So you have to realize who's controlled this world system. Remember, the devil has a complete counterfeit of everything the Most High has. The devil has his special people. God has his special people. So let's take a look at one of the devil's special children.
Now let's take a look at the role of the Rothschild family, the family said to be the wealthiest in the world. Money is the god of our time, and Rothschild is his prophet. Heinrich Heine. The mythology surrounding the Rothschild's wealth and power is two centuries old. The resulting mythology has proved almost as long-lived as the firm of N.M. Rothschild and Sons itself. Ever since the second decade of the 19th century, there has been speculation about the origins and extent of the family's wealth, about their political influence, not only in the five countries where there were Rothschild houses, but throughout the world, about their Judaism. The five Rothschild houses constitute an early version of what later became known as the multinational. Perhaps the most important point to grasp about this multinational partnership is that for most of the century between 1815 and 1914, it was easily the biggest bank in the world. Strictly in terms of their combined capital, the Rothschilds were in a league of their own until, at the earliest, the 1880s. The 20th century has no equivalent. Because they were so rich, the Rothschilds could plainly claim a material equivalence with the European aristocracy. They relished the sense that they were sans pareil. In this sense, phrases like kings of the Jews, which contemporaries applied to them, contained an important element of truth. That was exactly the way the Rothschilds saw and conducted themselves. There are no fewer than 153 species or subspecies of insect which bear the name Rothschild, as well as 58 birds, 18 mammals, and 14 plants, including a rare slipper orchid, Caffio pedalum Rothschildianum, to say nothing of three fish, three spiders, and two reptiles. The family's almost equally recurrent enthusiasm for the pleasures of the table has also bestowed the name on a souffle and a savory, prawns, cognac, and gruyere on toast. There are towns and numerous streets named after members of the family in Israel, Rothschild-owned vineyards at Mouton and Lafitte whose wines are drunk the world over, numerous Rothschild-built houses from the Vale of Aylesbury to the Riviera, and there is even a Rothschild island in the Antarctic. But this goes right in line with what Christ was saying in Revelations about the blasphemy of them who call themselves Jews but are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Christ calls it blasphemy which goes right in line with what we just witnessed. Adam names all the animals, then they come and add their last name to the end of them. If money is God, then Rothschilds is its prophet. And in the inner circles, they call them the king of the Jews. Okay, so to make a long story short, this family is one of the owners of the Federal Reserve Bank, formerly called the Bank of, U Bank of the United States. The Federal Reserve, the IMF and the World Bank are private organizations run by the elite families. The Rothschilds, Rockefellers, Morgans, JP Morgans. Okay, so here's a simple question. What is the Federal Reserve and how does it work? Most Americans can't even answer this question, but let's take a look. Let's say the United States needs money. Instead of issuing their own United States notes backed by their own credit, they issue treasury bonds. They then sell these bonds to the Federal Reserve, which buys them with money they created out of thin air. The money that the Fed created then goes to the U.S. The U.S. then pays interest on the money that the Fed lent to the treasury. So to clarify, the Fed creates money from nothing, loans that money to the U.S. and then charges interest on that money. What this means is that there is never and will never be enough money in circulation or in existence to pay back that debt. We as a country, as well as private citizens, are forever enslaved by debt with no way of ever paying it off. Now when the Federal Reserve buys bonds on Wall Street, the major financial firms that have been selected as dealers deposit the proceeds at their own banks. Fed rules require banks to keep 10% of their deposits in reserves, but the bank is free to issue loans equal to the remaining 90%. Let's say the Federal Reserve buys a $1,000 bond. After putting away 10% into their reserves, they are then able to loan out 90% or $900. 
Since the original $1,000 is still on deposit, the $900 in loan proceeds is more new money, money created out of nothing. A total of $1,900 of new money is now available in the economy. Now the person that took the $900 loan spends that money. The payee then deposits the $900 into their bank account and once again reserves and deposits increase. This process goes on and on until that original $1,000 bond, which was created from nothing, becomes $10,000, making this one full-fledged debt machine while also devaluing the dollar. The more money that is out in the economy, the more the value decreases. There's no wonder that since the implementation of the Federal Reserve in 1913, the dollar has lost over 95% of its value. The U.S. dollar will eventually be destroyed due to an overwhelming financial crisis and a globalist-run monetary authority will come along to save the day. And much like the Fed pretends that its goal is to prevent another Great Depression, the global currency will pledge to prevent another financial crisis, thus putting more power into the hands of a few and enslaving humanity that much more. Everyone at some point in their lives has heard of the Federal Reserve but most likely don't understand what it is or how it works. The Federal Reserve, referred to as the Fed, is a central bank that many economists refer to as the biggest robbery ever enacted on the American people. The reason for this is because the Federal Reserve is neither part of the federal government nor does it have any reserves. Yet, this single organization controls the money supply of the most powerful country in the world. The Fed is very diligent in hiding the fact that they are not part of the government. The last thing they want the American people to fully understand is that our government does not control our own money. In order to achieve this, they were very clever and decided to call their institution the Federal Reserve. And by labeling themselves this way, the general public never thought twice about who was in control of the country's money supply. The Fed is a private bank. They don't answer to anyone except themselves. The problem is we have a privately owned central bank system uh, in the United States disguised as a government owned system. Now, if you look in the, the uh, uh, telephone book here in the Washington, D.C. area, um, you look up for Federal Reserve in the blue government pages, it's not there. It's in the white pages right next to Federal Express. It's a privately owned central bank. What is the uh, proper relationship, what should be the proper relationship between a chairman of the Fed and a president of the United States? Well, first of all, the Federal Reserve is an independent agency, and that means basically that uh, there is no ag other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. When testifying before Congress in 2009, Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke refused to disclose which institutions receive trillions of dollars in these bailouts and loans, or give our representatives details about what deals were being made. So my question to you is, will you tell the American people to whom you lent 2.2 trillion of their dollars, will you tell us who got that money and what the terms are of those agreements? Hundreds and hundreds of banks, any bank, or that has uh, access to the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve's discount. You tell us who they are. No. Okay, now that we established that fact, so what caused the crash in the Great Depression of um, the Great Depression of 1929 and the economic crash of 2008? It's called a pump and dump scheme. Let's take a look. The country got sold on the Fed as an institution that would help stabilize the economy and remain independent of politics. But in fact, in close to a century of existence, the Federal Reserve has done just the opposite. Since they took charge, we've been robbed through inflation, and the purchasing power of the dollar has declined more than 96%. The Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, and the Morgans still control it, and they use this scheme to bail themselves out at our expense. I'm convinced that the near collapse of the economy in 2008 resulted from an orchestrated pump and dump scheme designed and executed by the big bankers to consolidate wealth and power. 
David Icke explains how he sees the Federal Reserve rigging the so-called business cycles. Stage one, it's like throwing a fishing line out. Stage one, you put lots of money, units of exchange, into circulation. You do this by pushing interest rates down, by making lots of loans. This is the part of the cycle we call a boom. Because there's lots of units of exchange in circulation, there's lots of money changing hands. That generates lots of economic activity. That generates jobs. And as more and more money is spent, there's more demand. So companies take out more loans of fresh air money to increase their production. People get confident in their everyday lives. Hey, you know, I work for this company. They've got lots of orders. Ah, it's really going great. My job's safe. I tell you what, we can have a bigger house. Then they start to change it. What they do is they pull the fishing line in. They push interest rates up. Now, fewer people, um, A, um, are taking out loans, and they make the criteria for having a loan from the bank stronger anyway. And also, now, as interest rates have gone up, a larger part of people's income is going to pay back the extra interest and not being circulated in buying things. Suddenly, there's nothing like as much money in circulation, and therefore, fewer things are being bought. Companies start to go down in terms of their profits. They start to shed jobs, and they start to go out of business. People lose their jobs, they can't pay the mortgage anymore of the big house they took out in the good times. Now what the banks are doing is starting to reel the fishing line in because as they go bankrupt, companies and individuals, the banks get the real wealth, the property, the land, the resources that they had signed to them for lending merely figures on a screen. Now this economic cycle of fishing line out, fishing line back, lots of units in circulation pull them in, has been going on for centuries. And what it's done, it's stolen and accumulated the real wealth of the world in the hands of the few. From the last economic crash, these Satanists have been using the Fed and the IMF uh, to get everyone drowned in debt all over the world by pumping $12 trillion of fake printed money that's backed by nothing under a program called quantitative easing or QE to which they've been printing sick. They, they have been, they were, it stopped now, 60 to $80 billion per month into the stock market, into the housing market, into the treasury program to create this fake, this fake uh, or this facade of a booming economy. So, for, so forced debt creation through student loan debt, which is at 1.2 trillion, car loans have hit 1 trillion, credit cards have hit a trillion, and then you have the housing loans, okay? And you have countries all over the world drowned in debt and no way to pay it back, okay? So once that uh, step is established, forced debt creation, now it's time to move on to the next step and to make, to make way uh, for the mark of the beast or this global economic system. It's called hyperinflation. That's the second step, hyperinflation, okay? So, remember the QE program of pumping billions of dollars into the market by just printing money that's backed by nothing? Okay, so that devalues the dollar that you have in your pocket to where you need more dollars now to pay for the same stuff. That's where food prices are increasing, uh, property taxes are increasing, the interest rates have started to increase. Now, what all this does, once inflation starts to rise, uh, we got hyperinflation. So let's look at how hyperinflation works. In Germany in 1923, people were doing strange things, like using money to wallpaper their houses and burning money for heat. What was going on? Had they all gone crazy? Nope. 
In the early 1920s, Germany was in the grip of something called hyperinflation. In order to pay massive reparations to the Allies after World War I, Germany printed a lot of their currency, the mark. One result of all this additional money was higher and higher prices. By November 1923, it took a trillion marks to buy one U.S. dollar. There were 1,000 billion mark notes in circulation. The mark was effectively meaningless. A similar situation developed in Zimbabwe a few years ago. Starting in 2007, inflation grew rapidly, like really, really rapidly. By September 2008, the International Monetary Fund estimated the annual inflation rate at 489 billion percent. In practical terms, the Zimbabwean dollar lost 99.9 percent .9 of its value between 2007 and 2008. It's hard to even imagine what that looks like. Prices nearly doubled every 20 24 hours and businesses revise prices several times a day. In June 2008, the Economic Times reported that a loaf of bread now costs what 12 new cars did a decade ago. The government issued currency in huge denominations to keep up with rising prices. The million dollar bill, the billion dollar bill, and finally in 2009, the hundred trillion dollar bill, the largest denomination of currency ever issued. The good news was that everyone was a billionaire. But the bad news was that those dollars were virtually worthless. One definition of hyperinflation is when a country experiences a monthly inflation rate of over 50%, or around 13,000% annual inflation. But believe it or not, Zimbabwe's recent inflation isn't unique, and it's not the worst inflation in history. In fact, the worst was in Hungary in 1946. Between July 1945 and August 1946, the price level in Hungary rose by a factor of 3 times 10 to the 25th. And yes, any time you have to express your inflation rate using scientific notation, that's a bad thing. Besides the obvious confusion over what price is to charge for things, why is hyperinflation so bad? Well, inflation, and especially hyperinflation, erodes wealth. In Zimbabwe, people who had worked their whole lives and saved up for retirement saw their savings just wiped out. Extreme inflation also forces people to spend as quickly as possible rather than save or lend. So there's no money available to fund new businesses. And all that uncertainty limits foreign investment and trade. So hyperinflation is bad. But how does it happen? Let's go to the thought bubble. So we're simplifying this stuff a lot, but the root of the problem in both Weimar Germany and Zimbabwe was that the government was paying their bills by printing new money. In 2015, they stopped this program of quanti quantitative easing, but they kept interest rates artificially low until now. And each quarterly meeting, they raised the interest rates. Okay, then they have announced that they, the Fed, when I say they, they have announced that they are planning to dump their balance sheet, their assets of $4.5 trillion. Now, this has a lot of financial experts worried because the question now is, are you going to dump it all at once or are you going to dump it in stages? Are you going to dump it all in stages and still raise interest rates? But just the mere fact that they're even talking about dumping their assets of $4.5 trillion and addition of printing 12 trillion dollars of money backed by anything and you have china that's starting to pull back their investments of united states this is going to cause a financial disaster hyperinflation you still have 96 million people americans out of work businesses and retailers are going bankruptcy like it's no tomorrow and there is more than enough for this to be a disaster way worse than it was in 2008. Okay, this will, we, we, we will be begging for the Great Depression when this goes down. So hyperinflation will naturally bring in the mark of the beast. In the book of Daniel, it says he will cause the daily sacrifice to cease. The daily sacrifice is our food. In the book of Proverbs, it says it's better to have a morsel of bread with peace than to have a house full of sacrifices with turmoil or with strife. The word sacrifice in your Strong's Concordance is H277. In the Hebrews, it's pronounced Zabak, which means to slay animals for food, okay? So again, remember, these people are working in stages. So once they bring, so they can't bring in the system all at once, okay? All over the world. So let's look at Venezuela. One of the 12 tribes of Israel, they're in Jacob's trouble just like other tribes are 
and just like how we're going to be in the U.S. So Venezuela, they're one of the 12 tribes of Israel. They're from the tribe of Asher. These Satanists brought down the economy and introduced hyperinflation. Let's take a look. After weeks of delays and violent clashes, new a bigger denomination banknotes have now gone into circulation in Venezuela. The new $20,000 notes should make transactions easier. It's an attempt to stabilize the country's economy. Some, though, think it will only exacerbate the spiraling inflation. Virginia Langeberg reports. Venezuelans stand in long ATM lines, waiting to get their hands on the banknotes, which their president hopes will help pull the country out of its economic crisis. For transactions, it's much faster, less paperwork with less money and costs on top. I hope it works and that you can withdraw normal notes and that it all flows well, like before. The new denominations range from 500 to 20,000 bolivars, replacing the most used 100 bolivar note that was abruptly scrapped last month by President Nicolas Maduro in a bid to destroy the black market. The snap decision caught many by surprise and the transition has not gone smoothly. The new notes were meant to be released in December, but their distribution was delayed causing chaos as Venezuelans rushed to spend the bills before they were taken out of circulation. Violence erupted as people raided warehouses in search of food and medicine left in short supply. The new denominations should make cash transactions easier, but relief may only be short-lived. The 20,000 Bolivar note is worth less than $6 on the widely used black market, and some believe the new notes will only exacerbate the country's high inflation. I think it is more of the same. Effectively, what we are doing is putting more money on the streets, attracting more inflation. The economic situation, that is getting worse and it will not change. More notes on the streets means more inflation, depreciation in the currency and nothing else. The 100 Bolivar note will now remain legal tender until February 20, while the International Monetary Fund is forecasting inflation to hit over 1,600 per cent this year, and few analysts believe the Bolivar will increase in value anytime soon. Virginia Langerberg, BBC News. Bread, medicine, toilet paper, these are just some of the basic necessities Venezuelans are struggling to find. The falling global oil prices have hit the country hard. Public services are disappearing one after the other. American officials are warning the country is on the brink of collapse. Venezuela is in a state of emergency right now. Its currency has been devalued 92% since the last two years alone. The amount of hyperinflation here is actually just unbelievable. You need a backpack full of money to buy. Well, in, in Caracas, in the capital city, we uh, have a, a very uh, tough time uh, accessing uh, basic necessities, but the people uh, in the interior of the country, in the states, in the province, have it even worse. And uh, we're not just talking about um, um, medicine, we're not just talking about uh, basic things such as toilet paper, we're talking about food. And that's where the situation escalates. Lines down the block for just basic necessities, lying down the blocks for public transportation that is insufficient. You know, and then a lot of people talk about the toilet paper with the government setting up a set price so poor people could afford a, um, toilet paper. Even in the driving rain, Venezuelans started their day in search of food, expecting to see the usual grim queues that form at government stores. Not today. The only stores with affordable food are shut, closed for the National Workers' Holiday, the sign explains. It says sorry and thank you. People walked away empty-handed but full of dread, wondering where their next meal might come from. And here's the thing, these people aren't allowed to come back tomorrow. Food is rationed here, doled out according to the last number on your government ID. Carlos Chirinos explains his turn is today. His number is five. Cinco. Cinco. Hoy me toca a mí. Cinco. Hoy y el miércoles. El miércoles. So he's saying that just today and Wednesday can he buy things. And because it's closed today, he's out of luck. The things that we have experienced, the things that we have seen here in Venezuela are absolutely 
insane. We went to the, some of the restaurants and uh, the, all the prices on the menu are in uh, paper and they uh, like taped onto the menu because they have to change it uh, every week and sometimes even more than that. Uh, it's changing that fast. Uh, it's, it's really like it's interesting and you brought up the gun free zones. That's the most interesting part to me is no one is allowed to have a gun and this is the murder capital of the world. So we walk into the hotel at night because we're a little crazy. We're told by everyone don't go out and we went out. Uh, there was no one anywhere. It was like a ghost town uh, and when we get back the security guard is hiding behind a door because he doesn't have a gun and the other the bad people all have guns. The, the situation in Venezuela is dire and it is dire in many different ways socially politically as as well as economically. Yama is a mother on the verge of a nervous breakdown. That's the result of five days without water. This is how we live now as Venezuelans. We've lost our quality of life. As you can see, we were middle-class people, and now we're not even that anymore. Just look at the kitchen. This is how we live now that we have no water. Now it's just arrived, so I've started the washing machine, and I'm filling buckets so that I can cook. Water and electricity are both being rationed. Everyone is feeling the pinch. Until last year, working four jobs, I earned about $300 a month. This year, working the same four jobs, I only make $100, and this will keep diminishing as our currency devalues. Ephraim is a trauma surgeon working in Caracas's public hospitals. Free health care was one of the foundations of the Chavez regime. These are all the bandages we've got, six little rolls. And these here are made in China, very poor quality. It tears your skin off. We've seen food shortages, medicine shortages, now basic services, electricity, even water, that is not reaching a big portion of Venezuela's population. This is what buying food looks like in Venezuela. Waiting for hours, hoping that by the time one hands in their allotted number, there'll still be food left. And this is what it feels like. This is the greatest sadness because I didn't know this Venezuela several years ago. For us this is something new, something unbelievable, unacceptable. It has no other name but catastrophic. I left home at four in the morning. I went to several places for nothing. All I could buy is a pack of maize flour. No more. This has to stop. The one who needs to leave will leave. We'll kick him out of power. Basic food supplies are being sold on the black market for 10 or 20 times the price supplied by the government. Without the black market, the country would crunch to a halt. At the supermarkets, the queues go down the street. There is no even coffee. If they can find sugar, they take hot water with sugar in the morning and they try to eat once at 3 o'clock to to, to be able to sleep until the next day. Asher, Venezuela, is like a crystal ball for the rest of the world, and it's going to get bad. I just can't emphasize that. Americans have never experienced this situation. Well, some Americans have, if you remember Hurricane Katrina, okay? They can't bring in the mark of the beast as it is now. So they have to make it so bad that you will beg for the mark of the beast. Again, going back to Revelations, where he says he shall cause. It's not force, it's cause. This will cause a situation where you want to get it. Again, remember Daniel where he said he will remove the daily sacrifices. You don't have food, food and water, come in and say, okay, and we'll give you this chip and you can get your resources. See how bad it is in Venezuela? If you say to them, hey, come get this chip and then you can get access to food, water, and medicine. Sadly, the answer for, for the majority of those will be yes. Most will get it. And again, in America, it's going to be a lot worse. And when I mean a lot worse, I mean they're going to turn off the internet, turn off the power at some point. Why do you think they keep talking about all this Russian hacking? They want you to know ahead of time who they're going to blame for when they turn the power off. So... They're going to say, oh, our infrastructure has been hacked. With hyperinflation, no power, it will be absolute chaos. The stores will be raided. Whatever's on those shelves, is that's it. They're bringing in no more daily sacrifices. The trucks aren't coming in anymore. So whatever's raided and looted, 
That's it. It will be a complete lockdown. And law enforcement will be instructed just to sit back, stay out of the way. Let 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 this let this they're gonna let this madness go on. Okay? Remember Hurricane Katrina. The first thing they did when they finally came in, when they finally came in, they went door to door to take away people's guns. They didn't render aid, they didn't help anyone, they didn't rescue anyone, they came for guns. This is the cause that Revelation talks about. They will bring about situations to where you willingly accept it. Okay? So, again, they will take away the daily sacrifice, our food, allow chaos to reign, then come in at the end as the saviors with this new system. Oh, we fixed the hacking problem, but hey, we have this new system. And you have to get it. And it says it will cause, you will get it, you will get this chip cause you want to eat, don't you? Think about your children. You need to get the chip cause they need food and medicine. You want to keep your house in your car, don't you? You will get it cause we've been hacked and we moved to this new system. So we don't know who owns what. We don't know anything. So this is, this is the only way to verify that's yours. Pretty crazy, huh? Now, here's the secret about your house and your car. If you're still making payments on it, you don't own it anyway. Okay, that's just a little secret. Let's move on. The cops in the military will get it because cause they want to keep their jobs and they want to keep their pension, which is again worthless after the system comes out. But the cause is we will save your pensions if you get this chip. Okay, your favorite celebrities and athletes, musicians and actors will be the first in line to get this. They won't hesitate one bit because they don't want to lose any of their riches or their position in this world system. Okay, so let's go over a quick overview of how it's going to go down. The following is a fictional story of events that may happen in the near future. 8 a.m. New York Stock Exchange. It's a cold, breezy day on Wall Street as markets await the Federal Reserve's announcement for QE4. Futures are up significantly. The Dow Jones just breached its 2008 high of 14,164. Gold just hit an all-time high of 2,900. Silver just breached $100 per ounce. The dollar index is holding at 53. With official unemployment at 16.3%, there is a nervous feeling on Wall Street that if this doesn't work, the world could implode into a depression that will last for the remainder of the decade. 8.19 a.m. Beijing. Chinese officials announced that they can no longer allow Washington to devalue their holdings. After making their concerns private, China accepts that Washington will never stop paying its debts with inflated currency. China makes an official statement from Beijing, quote, We have made our concerns known privately for some time. With QE4 about to be announced today, China will have no choice but to stop purchasing U.S. Treasuries. We have allowed Washington to try to work through their imbalances for four years. But with global inflation and U.S. consumers rapidly shrinking as a percentage of global GDP, we feel that a Western recovery is unlikely until they reform their entitlement programs. 8.45 a.m. New York Stock Exchange. Upon hearing the statement from China, Dow futures have a sharp reversal and begin to drop. Gold leaps past $3,000 per ounce, up $150 per ounce in the last 26 minutes. CNBC awaits a statement from the White House. 8.50 a.m. Washington, D.C. The president makes an official statement to calm investors' fears. He tells Americans that he has spoken with several G20 leaders. They have assured him that they will continue to increase their purchase of treasuries and believe that a strong U.S. economy is the only thing that will bring back global prosperity. He has also spoken to Chairman Bernanke who assures him that a strong dollar will be the result of QE4. The President also reminds Americans that his recent New Deal recovery programs that he passed through executive order will increase the likelihood of a lasting recovery. He also notes that Beijing, since 2009, has slowly been reducing their holdings, so the impact will be minimal. 9.51 a.m. New York. Dow futures fall 850 points in the first 20 minutes of trading. 
Markets are halted for one hour by the authorities. 10 a.m. Main Street, America. The news about the stock market in China has now spread. A panic begins to sit in and unprepared Americans rush to the grocery store. In an attempt to purchase food and water, Americans that didn't know what was going on are alerted by all of the news stories and panic buying. Within 50 minutes, there is a nationwide rush to the stores. Empty store shelves in America become a reality. 10.52 a.m. New York. Markets reopen and the Dow Jones resumes its collapse. Investors around the world join the sell-off in bonds and stocks and begin to purchase commodities. Unlike the panic of 2008, this time commodities are seen as the only safe haven from a dollar crisis. 11.30 a.m. New York. The Dow falls 1,700 points since reopening. Trading is halted for at least two hours. The Federal Reserve injects $200 billion into the markets and announces that QE4 will be delayed until further notice. Congress is called back to D.C. for an emergency joint session. Some members of Congress are saying that they consider China's statement a financial attack. 12 p.m. Main Street, America. Several cities begin to see civil unrest after grocery stores are forced to close. Traffic in the streets and violence break out. The president puts the National Guard on alert for a possible deployment onto U.S. streets if things don't get under control soon. Several news agencies are reporting injuries at grocery chains and call for the authorities to do something before it gets worse. 12.15 p.m. Toronto, Canada. George Soros tells CNBC that a run on treasuries is imminent and that there is nothing the government can do to stop it. He says it is unfortunate that a controlled decline of the dollar was not coordinated better over the years. Today really could have been avoided if not for the Tea Party politicians who demanded fiscal responsibility and a constitutional government. 3 p.m. Gold closes at 11.53 for the day at $4,053 per ounce. Silver closes at $173 per ounce. The president announces that due to civil unrest in some areas of the country, U.S. stock markets will remain closed for the rest of the day. With the exception of mining and other inflation-related stocks, the majority of U.S. stocks are down significantly due to the sell-off and flight to safety in commodities. The Federal Reserve announces that it will begin to purchase U.S. treasuries and stocks in order to stabilize the markets. But this only feeds investors' fears of a full-blown treasury run and collapse of the dollar. 6 p.m. Asia. Asian markets begin a massive sell-off. Dollar collapse rumors begin to take hold of the market. CNBC Asia looks into a possible comics default and complete breakdown in the U.S. economy. Gold spikes in Asia, up 1750 in the first complete hour of trading. Gold is now at 5803. 7 p.m. Gold and silver bullion dealers across the world have suspended all sales due to no inventory. A comics default is now expected. Several central bank representatives propose a freeze on currency markets and a fixed evaluation of the US dollar in order to calm investors. 7.30 p.m., the United States. The sun sets on America. In the last 12 hours, the world has changed. Americans are glued to their televisions, taking a crash course on a debauched currency. Smoke from fires in the cities have put a dark cloud over the nation. 7.45, the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve announces it will inject $1.5 trillion into the markets in order to stop any further decline in stocks. 7.55 p.m., OPEC. The final nail in the coffin. OPEC nations halt oil trades in U.S. dollars until further notice. They will only accept euros, renminbi, or gold. 7.59 p.m., the Federal Reserve's announcement to inject $1.5 trillion into the markets causes a sharp reversal in overseas markets. Stocks begin to rally even as Main Street melts down. 8 p.m., Manhattan. Gerard Adams, president of the National Inflation Association, sends out an urgent email alert. In it, he informs members that it is with great sadness that the time to warn and prepare Americans for hyperinflation has ended. Listen, lastly, I don't want to debate this with anyone. I've been talking to people. They have a thousand different opinions of the mark. Okay. Some people say it's not a, the mark is not a chip. It's an ideology. Okay. Whatever. With all this information I provided, some people still say this chip is not the mark. Someone said it's not the mark because it doesn't have 666 on it. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. The chip is the size of a grain of rice. So how do you know it doesn't have 666 on it? We don't even read the fine print of contracts. We don't read the terms and conditions 
on websites or apps we download. But all of a sudden during an apocalypse, you're going to ask a thousand questions to be super lawyer to make sure that it doesn't have 666 on it. Really? Okay. And here's another thing. Okay. John didn't speak English. So is it possible that when he saw or it says 666, it was in Hebrew since he spoke Hebrew? Is that possible? Hmm. Okay. Now, someone said, you know, in order for you to receive the mark, you have to give a public declaration that you denounce Christ. That's nowhere in the Bible. That you have to give a public declaration to denounce, uh, a public dec declaration of denouncing Christ. The devil's been st studying us for generations. He knows we're not going to give a public declaration of I hereby denounce Christ. Give me the mark now so I can get some, you know, so, so I can go get some chicken. No, 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 no. Again, what did the scripture explicitly say? He will cause them. Okay, we studied the word cause. We went through the word cause. Okay, so it won't be a public declaration of I denounce Christ in order to receive this mark. Okay, it's going to be so bad that you're going to be fighting in line to get this mark, this chip. Okay, so again, people have their own ideologies, what they think it is. And uh, one more thing, someone else said, oh, um, the Bible says it has to be in your right hand or in your forehead. Really? Do you really think John is going to name all the body parts where people got the, the chip? And secondly, is it possible the reason why John wrote down or John saw right hand or forehead is because that's the that's the places where the majority of the people got? Is it possible the minority got in their left hands or in their foreheads or in their arm? So John is not going to sit here and list every anatomy body part that they put the chip. Okay, you guys can be cute with the scriptures if you want to. And on Judgment Day, that's between you and God. Oh, God, it's, it said right hand, forehead. I got on the left. That's between you and the Most High. My job is to tell people what thus says the Lord. Okay? So, for everyone else who wants to, you know, if you want to live in Wonderland, that's on you. Okay, so in the next two lessons, I want to discuss how to survive this. Okay? Because there's a certain time frame we have to make it to. Okay? There's some things we have to do in the spiritual realm, in the, in the, in the spirit, spiritually. And there's some things we have to do in the natural. We have to do both, okay? So, um, the next lesson I'm going to talk to you about how to make it through what things we need to do spiritually, okay? And some things we need to look out for, okay? So, again, God bless. Love you all. Take care. Uh, and have a good day and good night.